Okay, we had a few questions from the registration period, so I threw in a slide because I wanted to actually address them as directly as I could. Someone asked, what are the most effective algae control chemicals for greenhouse use? Um, I like chlorine-based things on surfaces. Um, you can use chlorine-based chemicals on uh, countertops, glass, whatever else, and they do kill algae pretty well. If you put it in the water, so it's something that might wind up contacting your plants, I like peroxides. Peroxides uh, essentially oxidize algal cells. They're reasonably effective. It's pretty expensive compared to copper, but it dissociates into something that's non-toxic and in short order you can use that same order for irrigation or watering with no problem. Sometimes we use copper, but copper is a toxic chemical. I'm always nervous putting that into anything that's going to be used for irrigation. Um, it says we're interested in controlling algae in the greenhouse, in plugs, on surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. Well, see the above. It's sort of the same question away. Certainly, greenhouse floors, walls, surfaces, and so on, um, I, I like chlorine-based chemicals. I think they work pretty well. Uh, for anything that's going to actually contact the plants, I'd lean towards the peroxides. Uh, is the material in the presentation transferable to golf courses, et cetera? Absolutely. These are all the same processes. It, it works the same in each case. It doesn't mean the same technique is always going to be right. But yes, everything I've talked about isn't completely applicable to golf courses and properties. Uh, somebody's interested specifically in Nostoc. Nostoc is a form of cyanobacterium. Uh, it's very closely aligned to Anabena. Anabena is more commonly a planktonic organism floating around in the pond. Nostoc can grow on rooftops, on soil. Uh, it'll grow in plugs. I mean, it. it it's tough stuff, and it has a very heavy gelatinous coating, so it's resilient to drying. I have seen roofs that hold water, flat roofs, that then evaporate completely, and the nostoc sits there in a mat until it rains again and then starts growing. Very difficult stuff to kill. Now, it said they were interested in the biology. It didn't say they were interested in the control. I'm sure they meant that, but I don't have an easy answer for you. This is one of the harder ones to get rid of if you've got it because almost nothing kills it very well. Uh, almost lean towards physical te techniques, scraping it up, getting down to the point where you've got nothing there obvious, then use peroxide or chlorine-based chemicals to clean up the area where it was growing. Uh, but that tough integument on it, that tough gelatinous coating makes it very, very difficult to deal with. Uh, somebody else is interested in controlling algae used to irrigate floriculture and citrus through microsprinklers. Again, the key is control at the water source. Try not to be putting stuff into your irrigation system. Try to control it at the water source so that there's not so much algae entering in the first place. And I've talked about a variety of ways to do that, although, again, no one way is right. Um, how effective is barley in control of blue-green algae? The barley straw has been popular for a number of years in that when it breaks down, it releases compounds that appear to be effective algicides. Um, it does kill blue-green algae. Um, it won't always work, but it works a lot of the time. Uh, however, it's not a registered product for that purpose, so some registered applicator can't really use it. Uh, it's not licensed. Uh, it has a lot of variability in results. A friend of mine in Minnesota who's worked with this quite a bit, his definitive statement was, it works sometimes, and I'm not really sure why. Uh, basically, you're getting a breakdown product from the barley straw that is an algicide of some sort and seems to differentially attack the blue-green algae. Uh, it also has a lot of oxygen demand, so if you're in a system that's kind of a dead end or stagnant, that could be a problem. Some people have used digesters where they actually grew or actually digested the barley straw and then put the extract out into the water with an aeration system almost the same way we would apply aluminum or iron with an aeration system to control phosphorus, they put it out and they control the blue-green algae. So I don't want to downplay it because it can work, but it's not one um, that's considered a mainstream technique, and it's not one that your typical applicator is going to pull out of his tool bag to use. Um, how can you control algae safely and effectively? <laughs> Wouldn't we all like to do that? There's no easy answer. Um, control of nutrients is the first line of defense. If you have minimal nutrients, particularly phosphorus, you're not going to have algae problems. But that may be like asking you not to breathe if you're in a situation where a lot of fertilizer is being used or you've got a lot of runoff into a pond and the water is being reused over and over. In that case, you start falling back on the other things. You want to do it safely and effectively. That can be a tall order. 
it's not easy to be really effective and be completely safe. I mean, copper is very effective in a lot of stuff. I wouldn't call it safe, at least not not in a you know simple blanket statement. Um, so it it's difficult. Um, there's no simple magic bullet. You know, it, it, it's not an easy topic to deal with. And finally, how can we use aquatic plants to limit the growth of algae? Um, that's an interesting one. Plants can, in fact, compete with algae for nutrients, and they can certainly shade out algae. But neither of these is really easy to do because most plants get their nutrition from the sediment. That wouldn't be true for floating plants, um, duckweed, azala, water hyacinth, water lettuce, any of those. And of course, they're going to grow into a surface film that will, in fact, shade out algae. But they're also going to shade out, they're going to shade it out by restricting light, and then you're going to have a dark system underneath it, which may go anoxic and may have a lot of reduced substances in it, which you would not want in an irrigation system, and you would not want applying to plants. So the shade out portion is probably not the best way to go. If you have plants that take their nutrition out of the water column but aren't floating plants, um, uh, should not be a word, um, coontail, ceratophyllum demersum is one form. That will actually, it, it's a big bushy plant. It will grow on the bottom. It may not interfere with irrigation and such, but it will suck nutrients out of the water and could, in fact, uh, minimize problems with algae. But again, using plants to minimize algae usually results in a rooted plant problem, so people aren't any more happy. Okay. Well, Thank you, Ken. We yeah, got... I tried to make advance to the last slide, but it wasn't doing it. Thank you, Ken. We got two questions that people type. Okay. One, one is, what is the difference between surface algae and subsurface algae, and what are the implications in management of these two? Okay. Um, well, it's not a type of algae. It's just a physical position. Um, surface algae is anything that's buoyant enough to cause a surface scum. Blue-greens are the number one example of that. Many blue-greens have little gas vacuoles in them, which let them float to the top and make that surface scum. Uh, many algal mats, things like green algae that have uh, spirogyra, zygnema, clodophora, rhizoclonium, all these Latin names, but these are all heavy filaments that grow on the bottom, and they basically form bottom mats, which could then float up to the top at a certain point and become a surface scum. So they can go from literally being bottom algae to surface algae. Subsurface algae would just mean it wasn't right at the surface. That could be anything from bottom mats to things that are mixed thoroughly throughout the water column. Um, I tend to think in terms of functional algal groups. Any of the groups that form bottom mats can be a problem at the surface. Any of the blue-greens can be a problem at the surface. If it stays on the bottom, we usually don't worry about it a whole lot. The other question is, can you mention a little bit more about the plant species that can be used to control algae that grow at the bottom of the sure. pond? Um, the ones that I find most effective and they're the least objectionable. Um, Ceratophyllum demersum, the common name is coontail. Another bunch are actually macroalgae, cara and nitella. Cara is C-H-A-R-A -A, and nitella is N-I-T-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. These look like higher plants, but they're not. They're actually macroalgae. They rarely grow more than about six inches tall. They make a really nice carpet on the bottom of the lake. Uh, they suck up nutrients like crazy. They keep the bottom sediment from getting resuspended. I, you know, any lake I could have those as a bottom cover, I'd go for it. Uh, and ceratophyllum I mentioned. Um, naiads, Najas, N-A-J-A-S. There's three or four common species of it. Uh, Najas minor is considered invasive. It's pretty common in the south. but I don't find them to be that much of a problem. They tend to grow pretty densely on the bottom, and although they can break free and make surface mats, they tend to suck a lot of nutrients out of the water and minimize the algal bloom potential. And we have another question which would require you to answer an email, and that is if you can provide a list of references of studies that evaluate effectiveness of pond treatment methods in residential stormwater ponds. Okay, there, there are a number of books out that, that address the topic. There isn't very much written that's a simple thing for, you know, somebody to grab off the shelf who isn't, you know, an academic in this area and read it. I mean, the, the classic text, um, and actually I'm 
in my office so it's easy to walk over and pull these things off the shelf. Um, Restoration and Management of Lakes and Reservoirs, the third edition. It's Cook et al. And I can provide these uh, you know, to the moderator and they can get distributed to you guys. It's no problem. Uh, that's a great textbook, but it is a textbook. Boring is, you know what. Um, one of the more interesting ones is called Lake and Pond Management. It's by the same guy I mentioned that did the barley straw work in Minnesota, Steve McComas. And he's a heck of an interesting guy. He tries a lot of homegrown remedies and little stuff. Lake and Pond Management Guidebook um, by Steve McComas has a lot of little do-it-yourself, try this, this might work, and here's how I go about it type stuff in it. That's not a bad book to have uh, for, for almost anybody. Um, there is something available online, free, that's worth looking at. And it's the, uh, actually better get the, the name right here if I'm going to say this. It's Lost Eutrophication and Aquatic Plant Management in Massachusetts. Don't let the Massachusetts part scare you. It was done for the state of Massachusetts, but it's a 700 and some page document that can be downloaded off the web. And it has pretty much anything you'd ever want to know about how to manage ponds. And again, you probably don't want to know all that, but you could look up topics within it, just like an encyclopedia, and go through it. I happen to have been the final editor for that one, so I'm not really plugging it because I'm not making any money off of it. <laughs> but it is free, and it's online, so that, that's worth it. And there's a, com a companion guide to it that's only like 160 pages, which gives the bulletized version of, here's what you do if you had this, here's how this technique works, boom, boom, boom. It's very short and sweet. Um, but that's not a bad one to have either. Um, there's other stuff out there on the web. If you hunt around, you can find it. Just be very careful not to mix up an unbiased text talking about pond management with somebody's product sales operation. Um, I get very frustrated by that. I'm glad we have lake management projects out there. I'm glad there's people out there creating them and selling them. But there seems to be this tendency for everyone to want to claim that their technique is it. That's all you need. It'll fix anything. I can tell you that it's extremely rare to solve all your plant problems or all, all your pond problems, period, with any one technique. You almost always use need a second technique uh, you know, in, in your back pocket, and sometimes different problems require different techniques. Um, if this helps, I can provide uh, a list of, of references that are out there for folks, and that could be distributed. Someone is asking, can you please repeat the name of the free online resource? Oh, yeah, that's the, um, <laughs> you'd think I'd memorize it if I edited it, but it's, it's just too long. It's not a good title. It wasn't my idea. Eutrophication and Aquatic Plant Management in Massachusetts. And it comes off of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation website. So it's M-A-D-C-R. If you go to, I think it's mass.gov www.mass.gov. That gets you in the right area. And then look for the, um, the Lakes and Ponds program and their publications, and you can find it there. It, it is readily findable online. It's not that obscure. And we have one last Another, question. Um, one, one more thing about a place to go for information. I'd be remiss if I didn't plug this one because I do edit their journal. I'm the past president of the organization, the North American Lake Management Society. Don't, don't be put off by the fact that it says lake management. That includes ponds, reservoirs, everything else. That organization is the premier, premier organization in, in really in North America, but particularly the United States, dealing specifically with pond and lake management. And there's people all over the country who are members of that who can give you advice or help you. Most folks in there are very accessible, very friendly. I mean, yeah, they're making a living in many cases, but if you had a question and you called up NOMS and said, look, I'm, I'm in Arkansas. Uh, I'd like to talk to somebody about pond management who does that around here. Can you give me a name? They can do that. Or, hey, I'm in Florida. Do you have any certified lake managers here? Yeah, you've got like several dozen down there. And so they, they could help you find the resources that you needed, and it's a really good operation. There happen to be house based in Madison, Wisconsin, but it really is international and very heavily focused on U.S. pond problems. Another question is, would you recommend any shoreline plants for algae control? Shoreline plants? Well, shoreline plants aren't really going to control algae because the algae is a water issue. 
The shoreline plants are definitely, the shoreline plants are emergent plants. They are not going to take their nutrition out of the water columns. They're not going to compete with the algae. They could be used to stabilize the shoreline and minimize erosion. That, that would be great. I mean, anything you do with shoreline plants to minimize stuff getting through the, you know, a buffer zone and into the pond, that could be helpful. And there's a whole school of that, you know, what sorts of things to plant. You want to get multiple layers of vegetation. There's a lot of types of grasses. Uh, there's many plants that can help purify water on its way to the lake. But in terms of planting plants along the shoreline in the hopes that they're going to clean up the pond itself, if that does not work. Okay, I think we, we're done with this. And thank you very much for attending. And Ken, thank you very much for a very nice webinar. Okay, um, shoot me an email if you want a list of references, and I can respond to that, and that could be sent out to everybody. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.